So far we have said electrons behave as light, which have waves. So electrons have properties and characteristics of waves. For example, having wavelength, frequency, and speed. Well, Einstein came along and he demonstrated that light not only has properties of waves, but also properties of particles, meaning large objects. So light has wave properties plus particle properties. Well, de Broglie said then, well, if light has particle properties, then particles should have wave properties. So de Broglie combined Einstein's formula, E equals mc squared, E is energy, m is mass, and particles have mass, and c is the constant. So E equals mc squared is a formula for energy of particles. With Planck's formula, E equals hv, again we're talking energy of a wave. Energy of a wave. So he combined the energy from a particle with the energy from the wave. So he took those two formulas and combined them. He ended up with a formula which allowed him to find the wavelength of a particle when given mass and velocity. And remember, all particles or objects have mass and velocity. And there's that formula. We are not going to use the formula. You just need to recognize that as de Broglie's formula where he combined Einstein's formula and Planck's formula for energy. Einstein's formula is energy of particles. Planck's formula is energy of a wave. Okay, on this slide, if you printed the PowerPoint um, early, you may have to change some things on this slide because there's a major drastic error on your PowerPoint slide. So you may just want to reprint this page. Okay, from all of this, then Bohr realized that his model of the atom was wrong. Electrons, and what he said originally was electrons orbit the nucleus like planets orbit the sun. Okay, so he said electrons were kind of floating around the, that, the middle part, the neutrons and, and protons, kind of like electron, or kind of like the planets go around the sun. There are these nice circle, oval orbitals and you would be able to find where they are at any given time. Um, Bohr's model used his understanding of light as particles, but now they know that light also has wave properties, so electrons act like particles and waves. So now they're considering electrons in two different states. And from that came the wave duality of nature. Electrons have property properties of both particles and waves. Electrons have both properties of particles and waves. Well, because of that came a new line of thinking. For a long time, Newtonian mechanics was the focus of the study, was study for um, scientists. But with all this new information, scientists now have focused on quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics has kind of been the end thing to study. Newtonian mechanics deals with visible objects at normal speed. Um, you're only interested in particles, particle properties like size and speed. So we're talking about an airplane flying through the sky, a car driving down the road. Quantum mechanics deals with extremely small particles like electrons at velocities near light speed. And um, if you remember, momentum is mass times velocity. So with very small particles like electrons, a study of its wave characteristics can tell you as much about its behavior as its particle characteristics. So you have to look at wave and particle characteristics of an electron to fully understand where this electron's at. Well then came another dude, his name's Heisenberg, and there is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So he treated electrons as particles. And he said, it is impossible to know both the exact position and its exact momentum at the same time. So for an electron, we cannot know where it's at and its momentum at the same time. And you have to know both to fully describe an atom. In order to know an electron's position, it must be excited. And you should know by now if you excite an electron, it's going to jump to a different state. It's going to jump to a different orbital. 
Electrons are so small that the particles that would be illum illuminated, the electron also changed its velocity. So, in, so again, in order to know an electron's position, so in order to know where it's at, we have to illuminate it, kind of get it to light up. But when we do that, we change its velocity. We're changing its momentum. So to know where it's at, we're changing its momentum. Um, which again, you need to know both where it's at and its momentum to fully really understand an electron. And if you know its momentum, you can't know where it's at. So then there's Schrodinger. Electrons were treated as waves. Determine the probability of the electron from the nucleus. He, so he was trying to determine where's the best place for this electron to be at this mo point in time. So he determined the probability of the electron from the nucleus. Where is this electron going to be? Hence its energy. So how far away from the nucleus it is, meaning how much energy does it have. And we call that its probable position because, again, we can't exactly know exactly where it's at and its momentum at the same time, but we can have an idea of where it's floating around. So we have a probable position for these electrons. Because electrons move so quickly, the electron is considered to fill the entire space of highest probability. That space would be the electron clouds or the electron or orbitals are used to describe it. So the space occupied in electron, we call it the cloud or the orbital, and that's its probable position is what cloud or orbital it is in. Again, now we have some quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics uses four different quantum numbers to describe electrons. The four are N, L, M, and S. N, L, and M describe the orbital or where that electron is, where the highest probability we're going to find that electron. S is going to describe its spin. These electrons are spinning. Um, from quantum mechanics came the Pauli exclusion principle. No two electrons in an atom have the same four set of quantum numbers. So no two electrons are going to have the same four set of things going on with it. Okay, let's break each of these down. N describes the cloud size. In other words, its energy level. One, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. How far away is it from the nucleus? And as I talked the other day, those energy levels correspond to those rows on the periodic table. L is going to describe its shape. It's known as a sublevel. And there's sublevel F, S, P, D, and F. And we're going to spend more time talking about that in the le next lecture. M is its orientation within the cloud, um, the orbital it's actually in. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time dealing with M. And S is just its spin. Does it spin clockwise or does it spin counterclockwise? And the next slide shows some shapes of clouds that are found within an atom. So if you go to the next slide, the top one, that's just the sphere, that's the S. It's known as S sublevel. And then you can see the P sublevels. There's three of them. And then you can see the D sublevels. There's four, excuse me, there's five of the D, and I don't have any of the Fs there. So the S and the S, that can hold two electrons. Okay, then you have the P's. Okay, which there's three and the D's, which there's five. And we will be talking a lot more about the S, the P's, the D's, and the F's, and how many electrons are in each one. And this is all going to relate to um, some electron configurations, which is, happens to be one of the most important part of this chapter, which will be the next lecture.